So glad that uh, we have the opportunity to uh, be together uh, today. And we're starting this new series called Favorites, and we began to plan that out. I know that Ray had asked you for a variety of your favorite songs, and, and uh, we're planning out favorite passages of Scripture also. And today we want to start off with the 23rd Psalm. A lot of people have said that is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. So I'm going to ask you, if you would please, if you've got a Bible with you, turn to the 23rd Psalm today. It's in the Old Testament. If you're looking for a Bible, there's should be one relatively close to you in the chair there. You can reach in there and find that. It's on page 862. Page 862 if you are, are looking for Psalm 23. As we begin this series, I think that uh, it's one of those things you're going to really enjoy. But I want you to know as we start off with the 23rd Psalm, this is a psalm about sheep, but it doesn't really mention sheep. It actually is a psalm about people as well and about God not just being God, but God being a shepherd. Now, you might get the impression that uh, sheep are not all that popular of animals. You don't ever see sheep on the menu at a fast food restaurant, do you? I have never been to McDonald's and seen a McMuffin, not McMutton sandwich, okay? And I have never been to Five Guys and purchased a woolly burger. I've never done that either, okay? They might have dropped it on the floor, got a little hair on it or something, but it wasn't a woolly burger by design, at least anyway. And, you know, we might get the impression that, that sheep are not very well populated because in Florida, we mainly have cows and, and other animals like that around here, alligators. But, but, you know, around the world, there are a lot of sheep. In fact, in Australia, uh, there are uh, the number of sheep uh, over people are 10 to 1. In New Zealand, that number is 20 to 1. There's a lot of people there in those areas, but there are a lot more sheep in those areas. Maybe some of you have had experience in raising sheep or being around sheep before, and so this message might resonate with you this morning because of that as well. But this 23rd Psalm is one of the most beloved passages of Scripture, most well-known sections of Scripture. Kids learn it when they are in vacation Bible school when they're growing up or in children's church. And adults mostly are familiar with it as well. Even if they haven't been to church in years, they can still fill in the blank that says, the Lord is my blank. They know that shepherd goes in there. They also are familiar with the saying, uh, through the valley of the shadow of death. They're familiar with that also. So as we look at this today, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture that resonates with people. It has such powerful truth for us. It has timeless application to our lives in every century and every country as well. And so if you're following along today, which I certainly hope you are, there's, a, there's an outline on the back of your bulletin that you were handed today. You can fill in a few blanks along the way. There are only three blanks today to fill in, so it should be pretty easy for most of you, all right? So fill in those blanks, if you would, as we come to them. And the very first one is, the shepherd is a wise provider. Shepherd is a wise provider. You know, David understood sheep. He had been a shepherd. He'd been around sheep a long time as a boy. In fact, when we first learn about David, he is taking care of sheep on his father's farm. And he also knew God. And God inspired him to take those two ideas of knowing about sheep through experience and knowing God through experience and tying those together, saying, the Lord is my shepherd. He personalized this psalm for himself and for us as well. We can all say, if we belong to Christ, the Lord is my shepherd. And a good shepherd really cares about his sheep. You know, there's a, a, a writer several years ago, his, his name was Philip Keller, and Philip came up with a book entitled, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. He had been herding sheep in Africa for a long time. He decided to write about some of the characteristics of sheep and what it meant to be a shepherd. And he tells this story in his book about this farmer, the shepherd who was next door to him. He was adjacent to him. And Philip Keller's sheep had this nice green pasture. They were well taken care of. But next to him was this tenant shepherd who didn't take very good care of his sheep. His land was overgrazed because sheep will just keep on eating it all the way down to the roots, basically, until there's just dirt there on the ground. That's all you have is just the dirt. And they also were not very healthy looking. They were thin. They were diseased with parasites. Sometimes wild animals got in the pen. And Keller remembered especially how certain times of the day 
this other shepherd's sheep would come along the fence that divided their two properties. It was almost like the thin, parasite-ridden sheep were looking across, seeing all that green grass that was on the other side, seeing those other sheep that were well taken, over there, taken care of over there, and they were saying, we want to get away from this guy. We want to go over to that farm over there because we know that they are well taken care of over there. They long to come to the other side and to belong to him. The shepherd is a significant person. And David knew that a shepherd for us in our lives was very significant as well. The Bible has several names that it uses for God. But in this particular case, David says Lord, and the word he uses is actually a name that we're pretty familiar with. It's the name Jehovah. And the idea behind this is that God is a provider. That God is able to take care of us. He is self-existent. He is self-sufficient. He has unlimited power. And he has unlimited resources as well. He is a wise provider. And so at this point, the good shepherd is wisely providing for his flock of sheep. He knows his sheep. He is taking care of his sheep. And so David writes there in verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He is well taken care of right here because a shepherd is going to meet the necessities for his flock. A hungry sheep is not going to lie down because he's going to keep on nibbling away. He's going to keep on trying to find pasture to eat at. But when he is full, he is going to lie down. Isn't that interesting that David says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Now, you know, a hungry sheep, as he keeps on eating, and gets full after he is like that he feels very comfortable and laying down is a good thing for him my guess is today after you go out to eat or you go home and eat then chances are you're going to say you know I feel good I feel comfortable today and so you're going to go over on the couch and you say I think I'll see what's on television for a moment and you turn that on maybe the Rays game comes on about eight innings later you wake up to find out what the score was right because you start off watching it and you fell asleep because you felt very comfortable laying down there on the couch after you ate that meal and so when David is talking about he makes me lie down in green pastures he is saying God is taking good care of him that God is meeting his needs right here. And so he says, I will not be in want. And there's more to this as well. He leads me beside still or quiet waters. Now, sheep do not do well when there is really fast moving water. The very first sheep that I ever saw in my life was a dead sheep. And, and the story behind that is, is my dad, my granddad, maybe a brother or two and I had gone to this creek in southern Indiana called 14 Mile Creek. And there was this one section of it where there was a dam that went across the creek and it formed this place at the bottom and they called it Kettle Bottom. So oftentimes people would go down to Kettle Bottom and fish. That was a good spot to do that. With. But when we went down there, it had rained a lot. And if you're familiar with Midwestern rivers, you know how muddy they can look after a while, how fast moving they can be. And that's what we saw. This is water is just really muddy and it's flowing through there pretty quickly and going over the dam. But right in front of the dam was a sheep that had drowned. And it was being rolled in the water. You could just see it was head over heels and sometimes sideways in there. And, and of course, we don't know exactly what happened, but I can surmise what it was, that maybe that sheep got too close to the water pretty far upstream. And because its wool began to get wet, and because of the fast-moving water, it couldn't get out. It was unable to swim away from the current, and it ended up drowning. Sheep do not do well in really fast-moving water. Their wool does not work well with that. It's very heavy after a little bit and causes real problems for them. What sheep would prefer is water that's in a slow moving stream where there are pools of water that they can go down and drink from. And so David is saying, God is not leading me to fast moving water that would be treacherous for me, that would be dangerous for me, but God is leading me to still water. I can eat my fill in the green grass, I can go down along this cool water, this pool of water, and drink from that and I can be spiritually nourished and refreshed. And he also says, he restores my soul. 
You know, we watch television programs sometimes where these guys go out and they find these really old cars. Maybe they're in this barn somewhere and they, they have not been well taken care of. You can tell they've gotten rusty or there's old farm equipment out somewhere. And these guys come along and they, they purchase this and then they either themselves do the work or they take it to somebody who is a restoration artist. And they'll take it to them or do it themselves, as I say, and, and they show you on the program what it looks like as it's being pulled out of the field or out of the barn. And then it's taken to this place where they do the work and, and it shows you various times throughout the program the progress they're making. And by the end of the show, you can see that this old car that looks so bad at the beginning now looks fantastic. They've done a great job of restoring it. What they have done is they have taken something which was incomplete at that time and they have made it whole again. So the idea here is that if God is your shepherd, he is going to restore you to wholeness. He's going to restore your soul to wholeness. You know those old cars, they get grime on them, they get rust on them, they get grease on them. They just don't look good. Layers of paint might have been on different things. But all that is taken away and newness is given. And you know what? Our souls can get kind of gunky sometimes, can't they? We can kind of get some stuff collected on them. We can get some stuff that builds up after a while. And it just, just doesn't make us anything like what God wants us to be. But if he is our shepherd, he comes along and he restores us. He peels off all that other stuff. He renews who we are. And it means to be put back in the right place. He puts us back where we're supposed to be. It's like you know, if you wonder where your phone is, sometimes you can call yourself and find yourself. But if you've got it on silent, it's really tough, isn't it? By the way, please silence your phone if you would, okay? This morning, after I said that, two or three phones went off in that first service. So if you're not thinking about your phone right now, it might be a good time to think about it and to turn that off just in case. Because I know you don't know when a call is going to come in. But if you're looking for your phone, you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I am never going to let my phone out of my sight again. <laughs> I will hang on to that in my pocket, in my purse, wherever it is, you keep your phone, you're going to say, I'm going to keep it there because I don't want to lose it, or your car keys, or whatever it might be. And oftentimes, God restores us by putting us back in our right place. Isn't that important to know that? He puts us back in our right place. And he often restores us by bringing people into our lives or orchestrating circumstances that will help us to get where we need to be. And, you know, David is writing this psalm. Sometimes we get the impression that he is out in the field somewhere. He's playing on the harp or the lyre out there. And he's a young man and it's an idyllic situation. But in reality, this psalm was most likely written after David had a lot of life experience after this time, after he was king. And if you know anything about David's life, he made some fantastic choices, but he also made some that were very poor. And he had this one situation where he ended up having an affair with a woman named Bathsheba. And then he had her husband put to death in battle. And, and so he kind of just is in denial. He's living his life in a way that he knows he's not right. He knows that he's done wrong. But at the same time, he has not confessed this to God. He's not repented from this. And so for this whole year, David is kind of going through the motions. But inside, he is getting hollowed out. Inside, it's just like he's wilting inside. And so God loves David and wants David to get things back together in his life. He knows what David needs. And so he sends this prophet to him named Nathan. Nathan tells him a story about a little lamb that gets David incensed. And, and then uh, Nathan uh, tells David, you're the man. Uh, I'll tell you that story later on. Just trust me that this is a, a story of restoration. And so Nathan, pointing his finger at David, says, David, you are not right with God you are not right with God and what we find after this is that David wrote a psalm he says you know in this whole time I was keeping quiet my insides were just dying I, I my bones were like just shrinking up inside me this is what he says blessed are the, is he whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. God did not want to leave David alone. He wanted David to come to repentance. It says, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. 
Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And listen to this really important thing that David put at the end of that. He says to God, you are my hiding place. Isn't that interesting? He's been hiding from God, but now he has confessed his sin. Now God has been in the process of getting David restored, and instead of hiding from God, he says, God, I'm going to hide in you. Now my hiding place is in you, my shepherd. I want to follow you again. That came to David because he had come clean to God, and then he could truly say, the Lord is my shepherd, not just with words, but with a gratitude in his heart. And you know, sometimes there are people who, who come to services who are, are carrying this heavy burden. There's something that's happened in their life. They're, they're ashamed or they're embarrassed and they wouldn't want anyone else to know about it. And it's like their bones are kind of wasting away inside them and they're, they're just really being eaten up inside and they're hiding from God. They're maybe in church, but there's still this, this distance. There's this hiding from him. And God is saying to those people, listen, I love you. Don't hide from me. Hide in me. I want to be your shepherd in your life. I want to, to, to say, let's have this close relationship again. I am what you need. The shepherd's going to lead his sheep on good paths, it says. You know, it very well could be that you have an image of cowboys that involves a cattle drive. Remember those old shows and they get the horses out there and they're riding along and, and trying to drive those cattle off to somewhere in Kansas or in Texas or something and, and they're going to get loaded up for the market and, and this cattle drive occurs and sometimes it's going along slowly, sometimes there's like a stampede, but there's always a cowboy or two or three or more who are riding on horses, aren't they? They're actually driving those cattle. That's why they call it a cattle drive. They're behind the cattle, possibly beside them, but they're, they are guiding them where they want them to go. But you would never see a shepherd on a horse or a donkey in those days because you're always going to find the shepherd who is walking in front of the sheep. He is not going to be driving the sheep. He is going to be leading the sheep as he goes along. And so the good shepherd wants his sheep to follow him, and he knows the paths well. He knows where there's safety. He knows where there's potential danger. He knows the path that leads to life, and he knows there's a path that leads to death as well. And a sheep would be very smart to trust in the shepherd and to follow. You know, there's that wonderful passage in Proverbs 3 that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make your paths straight you know I think it's probably true that we have no clue how much God really wants to bless us how much God has for us if we were totally sold out for him you know what we would see if we really really aligned ourselves completely with him David says God's sheep will be on that path for their own blessing but he also says it's for his name's sake let's read this he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake you know, what David is doing right here is he is making an admission of ownership. When I was a boy growing up, uh, we raised hogs. And um, we would go out uh, early on when those pigs were relatively small. And we would take this, this machine or this, uh, this grippy tool, I guess I should say. And we would come up with the hogs and we would kind of notch their ears. And that would indicate what litter they were from and what number in that litter they were assigned. And so we could look at that pig when it grew up to be an older hog, and we could say, you know what, that was uh, the hog that came from this particular mother hog over here. And that was the number in that. It would just be an identification process. And in those days, for shepherds, the sheep, uh, the shepherd would also do the same thing. He would come along with a sharp knife, and he would notch the ears with his own particular mark so that when the sheep began to mix with other sheep, that all the shepherds could distinguish which ones were theirs. And the sheep would also, of course, know the voice of their own shepherd, but that would just take away any kind of guesswork. That shepherd and that sheep go together is what that is. It's a mark of identification. And here we find that, that uh, uh, those sheep that when they're observed by other people, they can say, boy, those are good-looking sheep, or those sheep don't look very good. And if it's a good-looking sheep, then the shepherd is going to receive some sort of glory for that, 
some sort of praise for that. That shepherd is such a good shepherd. He takes care of his sheep. And so when we embrace the phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, we're also admitting that we are his sheep. And the question we ought to ask ourselves is, am I reflecting well on my shepherd? Am I reflecting well on my shepherd? The shepherd is guiding in paths of righteousness. My dad came down on Tuesday. Uh, on Wednesday after lunch, he and I drove to Key West. <laughs> that was a long drive. We got down to that uh, marker that was 90 miles from Cuba that probably many of you have been to. Uh, I've got a picture that was taken of us at 9.12 in the evening. Okay? And, and we left there and we drove back up to Key Largo and spent the night up there. And then the next day, Dad had never been to Miami, so we drove to Miami, and then we got back home here in Sarasota about 4.30 that day. So it was a whirlwind trip. I mean, it was really quick, but I can guarantee you 365 miles down, 365 miles back to the Keys at least anyway, and we talked the whole way. It was really good. And one of the things we talked about was we talked about baseball. And in talking about baseball, there was an old player that both of us were very familiar with. His name was Yogi Berra. How many of you have heard of Yogi Berra before? Many of you have. Some of you probably remember the Yogi Berra cartoons. That's probably your connection with Yogi Berra, all right? But this was a real player. And Yogi Berra uh, had a book that came out several years ago uh, before he died, and, and uh, they were called Yogiisms. And Yogi always had these quirky ways of saying things that were kind of fun. And one of the things that Dad and I talked about was one of the things that Yogi said, he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Most people say, which way do I go? He says, take it. You know, he would come up with kind of silly stuff like that that didn't really make sense but sort of did make sense in a way. And I want you to know, for Yogi, that was fantastic, and it gave us an opportunity to chuckle together. But David is very clear here that when you come to a fork in the road, take the path of righteousness. That's the one to take. The shepherd is also a comforting protector as well. Look at verses 4 through 6 with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That phrase, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, describes what a sheep might be going through at different times in his life. During part of the year, the shepherd would keep his flocks in the lowlands where the grazing was good. But sometimes the, uh, the, the weather change would occur or sometimes there wasn't enough rain and so uh, all that grass would kind of disappear. And so the shepherd would begin to lead his sheep to higher ground where there was other grass up there for them to eat. And to be able to do that, he would sometimes have to lead them through a shadowy area like a valley. And there would be predators in there like a, a wolf or a lion or a excuse me, or a bear. It'd be a very dangerous place for the sheep. But notice what this verse says. He says, through the valley of the shadow. What's the difference or what is the definition of a valley? A valley is a section of land between at least two mountains, right? A valley is what's in between right there. And so it's telling us right here that we have gone, the sheep have gone from one high spot into a low spot while they are going to another high spot. That's what a valley is all about, right? You go from one place to another and you're passing through this low spot that has, in this case, lots of shadows. And I tell you what, we can be in valleys in our own lives, can't we? We can go through difficult times in our own lives. We can say, I, I, I don't know if I can handle this or not. How did I get in this particular place? This situation is beginning to consume me. This situation feels like a heavy weight on me. This valley is a valley of discouragement. I feel like I'm struggling throughout this time. And the truth is that sheep are not supposed to stay in that dark valley, and nor are people, nor are people. David says, even though I walk through, what that means is he started in one spot at the beginning of that valley. He's walking through that valley to get to the end of the valley, isn't he? He's walking from one spot to another spot. He's going through that valley, but he's not intended to stay in that valley. And oftentimes as we're going through the valley, we're wondering, am I supposed to stay here? Why is this happening to me? What's going on? And God may be saying, I'm taking you to a new spot that's going to be really good for you. But to get there, we have to go through this. And what we need to understand is that even though our journey isn't complete, that God is going to be with us in that. 
Some of our journeys have some difficult times, don't they? Our valleys are tough. The doctor says to you, you know, we've done some tests, and I, I want you to go visit this oncologist friend of mine. Here is his number. Call this guy because he is going to talk to you about your condition. And as soon as you hear that, you're thinking, I am in the valley of the shadow of death. The school administrator says to you, sorry, you can't start school this year. Your scholarship money has not come through. The bank says, we're going to foreclose on your home. The spouse says, I'm sorry, I don't love you anymore. I am leaving you. And you are saying, I am going through this valley. This is a tough time right here. But God knows what you're going through. And the good shepherd does not run away when you are in the valley. He leads me through, right? Isn't that what this says right here? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. You are with me. The good shepherd is not leaving right here. It says in scripture that God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. David says, I'll fear no evil, you're with me right here. And he uses these two images of a rod and a shepherd's crook as well. Now the rod is for protection. The rod is for protection right here. Uh, we got a picture up there, I think, or getting ready to have one that shows a shepherd that is using that rod and he is beating away wolves who are trying to attack the sheep. That is part of what that's about. That's the idea of the rod. And there's the staff, and the staff is used for correction. It is the smaller, thinner stick that has a hook on the end of it. Just like the old little bow peep pictures or, or like the images that we sometimes have of a shepherd walking along with this crooked staff, that is what we find that David is talking about. And that was there so that if the sheep begins to get off the path, he can pull it back in. He can correct the sheep. So we have protection with the rod. We have correction with the staff. Our shepherd provides us with protection and correction. And the shepherd is also a gracious preparer as well. Look at verse 5 with me. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. When David was running away with several from his household, he was running away from his son Absalom. Absalom had been a rebellious son. He was now trying to kill his father. You can imagine how difficult that situation must have been for David. And David is running for his life away from his son Absalom. But as he and some of his household are leaving, they get to this one spot, and you can read this story in 2 Samuel chapter 17, where there are three men. They're not even Israelites, but they come along. They are Shobai, Makur, and Barzillai, and they bring things out to David to encourage him and his family. They bring bedding and bowls and pottery and wheat and barley and flour and roasted grain, and beans, and lentils, and honey, and curds, and cheese, and sheep for this family to eat, to take care of them. And David is probably looking back on that, saying, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. And what that means is not like going up to the fast food restaurant and them asking you, is this to stay or to go? You know, it's not like that. This meal is to stay. This means to sit there and to relax and to receive refreshment from it, to be able to, to, see, to receive uh, enjoyment from it. It's a sit-down type of meal. And in Scripture, whenever you find uh, a meal being talked about, it's always associated with fellowship and unity and communion and relationship with God. And what that means for you and for me is this. Even when it feels like life is falling apart, and it will feel like that at times, it feels like people are against you or that it feels like God has forgotten you, that God is still there providing for you, still protecting you, still present in your life. David says that his head is now anointed with oil. A couple images come to mind right here. First of all, David had been anointed uh, as a young man who was going to be the next king of Israel. So anointing was setting apart someone for, for great service to the Lord. But there's also the picture of how, how in those days, which is similar to what might be used today, there was like a, an oil that was almost like a dip, um, like a medical thing, put on the sheep's face and around where their horns would be. And, and that was to keep flies and parasites away from them. You know, flies and parasites are just, they're just really bug you, don't they? I guess that's where that term bug comes from. And they, they fly around and they're irritating and they're little, but they just kind of distract you. And this is saying God wants to 
keep you from those little irritating distractions that keep you from really following the shepherd right here. He also says in Scripture that, that the Holy Spirit is represented by oil as well. So God gives you his presence through the Holy Spirit to help you. That's an anointing with you. He says, my cup overflows. And you know what that is? That's a sign of abundance right there. God is able to make the cup just keep on overflowing. His resources never run out. And then David begins to get close to the end. He says, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Some of you probably remember when Saddam Hussein was going through Kuwait and having war there. And as he was leaving, he left a trail of destruction behind him. He had burning oil fields. He had killed people. He had torn up things and looted homes there. It was a mess when he was leaving with his army from there. But as Christians, we have something else that follows behind us. And that is goodness and love follow behind us. Now, how long does it say right here? Let's take a look. All the days of my life, let's do something together. What if I ask you a question? What if I say, how long? What if you answered all the days of my life? Why don't we try that? How about I say, how long? All the days of my life. You guys are fantastic. That first group was wimpy compared to you guys, all right? How long? All the days of my life. And how long? All the days of my life. You got it. All the days of my life. You know, even in heaven it says that the Holy Spirit says that those who have died in the Lord says they'll rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. Isn't that kind of cool to think that the deeds we have done here that are good deeds for the Lord are going to follow us, that God is going to praise us for those things? Let's repeat something else together. And I want you to think of this image here with the idea of being a sheep, okay? I've got a rod on one side. Let's say that. I've got a rod on one side, okay? Let's say it again, okay? One, two, three. 